Hey, everybody. Welcome to the USA Baseball webinar. Uh, my name is Matt Farrell with Bat Around and uh, pinch hitting a little bit on the intro. Andrew Bartman, Bartman from uh, USA Baseball having some connectivity issues uh, in, in a set, you know, so he'll be joining us shortly. But I, I think everybody knows uh, of Clint Hurdle and what an incredible career and character and person that he is as well. Uh, we work together on Bat Around, um, which is one of the presenting uh, partners of this webinar and a developmental partner of USA Baseball. But I just want to really introduce a very good friend and come to know him over the last few years of 1,269 wins as a as a manager and with the with the Rockies and the and the Pirates and Clint, you may correct me, 46 or 47 year career uh, in the sport of professional baseball. So. Well, I don't ever want to correct you in front of 450 people. It was, it was 45 years in uniform. Uh, I, I retired for two years, failed at retirement, as Carla likes to remind me from time to time now when I head out. And I put two more years uh, onto the chalkboard. So I've got a running total of 47 years in organized baseball. Well, Clint is also the co-founder of Matt Around. You can find out more about Bat Around, really, which, which we think is a great tool. We'll show you a video later uh, at letsbataround.com or the Instagram handle of Let's Bat Around, uh, same on X as well. But without further ado, really just want to open it up to Clint to share some thoughts and allow plenty of time for Q&A. So, Clint, take it away. Well, thanks, Matt. I appreciate everybody that decided to spend uh, an hour with us tonight. Um, I know there's many opportunities and many places you can go for content, uh, for opportunities to learn. Um, you know, I spend my days kind of pursuing knowledge and wisdom. Uh, I look, I hunt for the good stuff. I don't get caught up in the fist fights, um, which kind of leads us into the topic uh, that we wanted at least to roll out tonight was basically, you know, I hear a lot going on. When I left the game in 2019, was fired by the Pirates. I spent two years as an independent contractor. I had multiple calls from GMs, from managers, college coaches, JUCO coaches, high school coaches. We've got a great program down the road here. I live on Anna Marie Island, not 15, 20 minutes away. IMG, I've seen a lot of high school programs. And there seemed to be somewhat at times of a rift. There was the old school mentality versus the new school mentality, the old school techniques versus the new school techniques. Um, some places work better than others. Some places wasn't working at all. I could tell by the number of phone calls I was getting from coaches of players, probably the lowest age would have been 14, 14 year old players to guys that were working with players that was old as 40. So it was covering a lot of ground. A lot of ground. And there seemed to be a tug of war in some areas. And as I would listen, and some would be venting, some would be ranting, um, some would share why you know they were right, and some people would share why they were wrong. Um, I just kind of sat back, took notes, and I figured out, you know what, old school versus new school, I'm going to encourage everybody just to be in school. Um, it's not up to me. If you and I, if Matt and I say we have two different theories about something, um, it's not up to me to try and get Matt to believe in mine. I'm just going to share mine with him. Matt can make a decision whether he wants to believe in what I got to say or think it's got some val you know, some validity or not. I don't need to force him into my way of thinking that if he doesn't, then I'm going to be disappointed or upset uh, or you know, we're going to disassociate. I see a lot of disassociation going on as well through these uh, the, these struggles and these tugs of war. And actually, it started for me big time this last year, back in the game for two years with the Colorado Rockies, still working some college programs, helping some college coaches out, still working with uh, Perfect Game Showcase. That'll start a fist fight with some areas. Uh, the Showcase, uh, the All Star Game, the All American Game, uh, the Wood Bat Tournament. Um, 
So I'm still working with all different types of players and ages. But in December, one day I was just scrolling, looking for some good content. And almost like the, it was like the wild, wild west on a hitting situation and, and some people. I could just hear the guns shooting in my mind. You know, this guy, rah, 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 a bunch of rant, a bunch of argument. And I finally just said, OK, I'm going to stop. And this was a tweet I sent out, which, as my son explained to me, it seemed to be get a lot of views. But the tweet that I sent out was, OK, I've, I've read enough for today. We got radar guns, track man, driveline, K-Vest, rap soto, videos, stopwatch, et cetera. None of these can measure guts and nuts. Those are difference makers. That was my comment. I didn't say track man is no good. I didn't say I don't believe in driveline. I didn't say I don't believe in a stopwatch. I don't believe in a radar gun. I just said there's a certain inherent part of our game, which don't miss. Some of us, I think, are missing. It's played by human beings. Whether they're eight years old, they're 12 years old, they're 22 years old, they're 32 years old, at the end of the day, they're always going to be humans. And we put ourselves in a position where some of these things have become idols for us, uh, whether it's exit velocity, whether it's launch angle, whether it's spin rate. These are all useful tools. They're tools that I pay attention to with the Rockies now. They're, they're tools that I pay attention to at high school games. In our evaluation process, we accumulate data and gather data. I'd like to make sure, though, what I had to learn was I just wasn't a data gatherer, but I actually could accumulate data, and then I knew what to do with it. <laughs> and I knew how to digest it in small spoonfuls, so it makes sense. Um, I just don't see our industry making the progress that we're capable of making if we're inherently fighting with one another. Um, there are so many young people that I've learned from in the past five years now. Uh, we have a brand new research and data you know, uh, department in Colorado. Um, I'm learning from these people. I'm learning all the different ways analytics can be used. I was starting to learn them in Pittsburgh the last few years. And actually, we were one of the first teams that took the data and put it into play. And we were probably with Tampa. We were the front runners of the industry uh, over a course of uh, – from 2013, we put all our chips in. By 2019, I'd say so many organizations not only caught up, just they passed us. Uh, some organizations were able to throw a lot more money at the data and the analytics and the research than we were. But there's a great, there's a really good book out. I won't say great, there's a good book out. If you want to talk about the pro game, because I'm going to get off that, but the pro game, analytics and data, it's called Big Data Baseball. It was written by um, Trevor, so uh, Trevor Sawcheck. Um, he's a writer now, a good own magazine. Matt, you can look it up, Google it up for it, make sure I got the right name. I think it's Big Data Baseball. It chronicles the, 20, chronicles the 2013 season of Pittsburgh Pirates when we broke a 21-year non-playoff game streak and a 20-consecutive-year uh, losing streak. Um, 21 years without the playoffs, 20 years without uh, a 500 record or better. Um and that's the thing on that. As far as what I'm going around now is I've got some friends that coach high school baseball. I've actually got guys that are my age. It's going to be hard for you to believe, but they have grandkids playing ball. I'm actually old enough to go to some games with my buddies and watch their grandkids play. You want to talk about a hoot. Um, I'm watching 8, 10, 12 years old. I'm watching them go through their practices. I'm watching them do their things. And Sometimes the coaches may know who we are. Sometimes it's just a bunch of cute tips sitting in the stands. Um, we don't draw attention to ourselves. We just pay attention. And we're hoping the kids have a good time. We're hoping the coaches enjoy what they're doing with the kids. Um, but we've seen some things that, you know, every once in a while, my suggestions at the end of the day, if you're in a program and your kids are 8 to 14, let them be kids. Let them play. Move them around. Let them play different positions. It's amazing some of the things I've seen coaches stumble into in the last few years by moving a player off a position that they, you may have felt or the coaches need to feel or the parents need to feel. They need to play here, and that's that's only where they need to play. Um, move them around. You never know where your next shortstop is going to come from or your next pitcher is going to come from or your next center fielder or first baseman. I just encourage you to move them around. This is just encouragement. You know, they're your programs. Actually, they're the kids' programs, but you know, they're your programs. You're the coach. You're in charge. As far as, you know, the work with the parents, sometimes it's better to build a bridge than it is to build a wall. I'm, I understand parents can be challenging. 
um, because the money that's invested. <laughs> I actually spoke to a group of parents in a youth league last week. There was 250 of them. <laughs> Tried to gently explain to them they're not general managers just because they've invested X amount of dollars in the young Johnny's program. They're not the general manager. Uh, be a parent. Root for the kids. Root for the coaches. Is there any way you can help make the coach's job easier? Because many times I do think, you know, we make people's jobs harder. Best advice I got the day I took the managerial position in Colorado was from Kelly McGregor, our team president. And Kelly said, you know what your job as a manager is? And, of course, me being a brand-new manager is to win games. He said that's one of the responsibilities. He said your first responsibility is to make my job easier, Dan O'Dowd's job easier, and your coaching staff's job easier. He said that, in turn, will make your players' jobs easier. And eliminate distractions, get everything out of the way, so when these kids run out on the field, they can just play. Wow. Now, that's wisdom. I still use that today. Um, I'm a firm believer in transparency. Whatever position you're in coaching, it, breeds, it, it builds trust. Um, when you share with your kids, you know, there's a difference between being a drill sergeant or just telling them a story. And sometimes the story doesn't have a storybook ending. But tell them a story. Here's where I see you right now. How do you, where can we get with your progress? Where do you, what, what are you dreaming about? Where do you want to play? Um, I think everybody pulls and pulls for those that persevere and are resilient and that battle. And you see a lot of that in kids that are 10 years old trying to figure out, man, they want to be on the field. They want to play. They want to do good things. It's, it's not as hard as to, it is to clap for a kid as it is to, to encourage a kid when he's not playing well. And I think those are the times we got to step aside, really put on a different set of coaches' clothes, and just they're, they're, they're human being clothes, uh, because we all have to deal with adversity. We all have to deal with struggle. We all have to deal with you know lack of success. Uh, I'm not a big fan of calling it failure all the time because it's just a different opportunity. Um, but I encourage us all to get out of this tug of war, whether it's with parents, whether it's with analytics, whatever it might be within your your board of directors, because. My daughter, Madison, who's now 21, uh, Madison's a special needs adult, 21-year-old adult. But she had this saying during the last political election, and this is all I'm talking about politics. She goes, I love it when Joe Biden gets on and says it's not about the red states or the blue states, it's about the United States. And I thought, coming from a 21-year-old, or she was 17 at the time, that doesn't have a political feel for anything, but just knows what sounds right. My encouragement is to us that all night, whenever this is over, we go back and coach it. Let's not look at this as we're in a fight or we're in a tug of war. Let's find a way to build a bridge to connect the dots and try and build some traction or some ground force. We can all work together and, and get better. Um, I always remind my coaches and the people that are in our program, you know, complaining without providing solutions is called whining. And a lot of times whining is associated to, you know, adolescents or it's associated to young teenagers. I've been in big office buildings with, with big office rooms and, and heard whining um, and heard condescending talk. Um, my encouragement has been uh, to find the fun. Uh, you being on this thing tonight means you're probably a leader of some sort. And I think part of leadership is also followership. And there's times you may need to follow your coach. Maybe there comes a point in time where you can empower your coach with a drill or a performance or an ability or something with, a, with the kids that puts him in a different light in front of your team, whether they're eight, whether they're 18, whether they're 21. So you enhance their role or responsibility where it's not just you're the go-to guy all the time. What's going to happen if you're not around? I'm a big fan of developing a plan B on any coaching staff I've ever been on. And in, in the major leagues, this isn't for public consumption. You can look it up on the internet, but I'm just going to tell you a little secret. I was astonished a couple of years after I was done managing, I found out I ranked 13th in all-time ejections in Major League Baseball. That's way too high. That's somewhat embarrassing. 13th. That's a lot of games I got tossed. And obviously, I wasn't playing nice. I got put in adult timeout. But I, but I found time to have, you know, what, what I would do when I got tossed. You know, I, I know managers that stay around the corner. They call all the shots. Or they got a runner where they're telling the kid what to do, and he goes down to the coaches, tells them what to do, and he runs back up. 
I went to the clubhouse. I went upstairs to my desk, put my feet up on, put my feet up on my desk, sat down on my lazy chair, said, "I'm done for the night. Let's see how they do." What a great learning experience for my coaches. They got the first guest finally, because some of you are head coaches, some of you may be managers, and you've got your assistants and your other people. Believe it or not, those coaches, they're second guessing you a lot. Not in a bad way, but anytime you make a move, they're probably thinking, hey, I may have made that move. Hey, maybe I wouldn't have made that move. Bring them into the conversation. After a game that maybe went, went didn't go well, share your thought process. This can be in Little League. This can be in, in, in Pony League, Babe Ruth League. Share your thought process of what you did, why you brought Jimmy into pitch with Johnny, and why you moved Steve off a shortstop and put Phil over there. Just give them some feedback. We're building community in everything we do, and the more conversation we can have together, I think the better off we are. So your leadership, you can be in followership. That other coach has got a really good idea. Tell the team, hey, I was talking with Dave. I was talking to Andrew the other day. Andrew came up with this idea. Andrew, share with the team what you thought. Boom. Coach is out. Andrew's in front. Players are listening to Andrew. So that day when Dave gets thrown out of the – Clint gets thrown out of the game, Andrew takes over, no big deal. They've seen this act before. Andrew's next in line, and Andrew's our go-to guy. Because at the end of the day, man, if you're not a leader and you're not a follower, you're a roadblock. And I can tell you quite honestly, there's been days in my coaching career I was probably a roadblock. I was in the way. I wasn't committed either way. Um, you know, let's make sure that, that we're providing behavior that it's attractive. Uh, we're providing a thought process that is attractive. Again, everybody likes a story. When I would sit my team down, there's sometimes, you know, it may be a little heated. It may be a little more less conventional, but I would bring a different coach up and share a story. And we used to have a time limit. It was just two or three minutes. But kids like to, to be told a story. Major league ball players love to be told a story. And if you can incorporate the teaching into it with some human elements in it, some human analytics, I think that's my other encouraging point tonight. Let's not lose sight of the human analytics that are involved in the game of baseball. For any kid that picks up a bat and a glove and runs out on the field from the first time to his millionth time, there's a heartbeat inside that kid. Most kids want to be good. Some kids want to be great. Some kids are playing because their dad wants them to play. You got a lot going on out there, but they all got a heartbeat. Find a way to help them, you know, have fun with that heartbeat. When we're out there as leaders and as teachers, I mean, what are we chasing? If you would pull your kids aside, an exercise I used to do with my, my players, I would ask them, what do you think my expectations for you are? And Andrew, this is what I want you to think, think hard about, but I learned the hard way my second year in Pittsburgh. I'd never done this before managing, but I brought each player in in spring training and asked them, what do you, what are your, what do you think my expectations for you are? The answers I got were unbelievable. The first one blew my head off going, okay, I'm on to something here. I can't believe I didn't think of this eight years ago when I was managing Colorado. Marte told me I need to hit 25 homers. I need to hit 40 doubles. I need to score 100 runs. I need to drive in 100. I need... When he got done, I go, star, you do all that, you're going to be the MVP. We're going we're, to we're have a really good team. And he goes, well, well, that's what you want, right? I go, star. No, that's no, that's not what I want. I said, I want you to be the best left fielder on this and in, 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 in on this ball club. I want you to be the best teammate you can be. I want you to drop that bat and run down that line. I want you to play hardball. I want you to protect your teammates. I want you to show up on time. I want you to, to not make excuses. That's what I want you to do. And he looked at me like a thousand pounds had been taken off his shoulder and just said something simple. I think I can do that. So I think he just put him in a better frame of mind. And I'd be, I'd be surprised if you, some of the college coaches that may be on here, uh, if you asked your players what, what they thought your expectations were, I think you might be surprised. Um, we need to chase the good stuff. There's a lot of things in this game we can chase, whether it's velo, whether it's spin, whether it's launch angle, whether it's vert, horizontal. I just encourage us to chase, you know, along the way, just good old baseball. Chase some good old baseball. Incorporate the analytics when they make sense, but there's a lot of guys on here, I'm sure, that aren't even using analytics right now. Good, good old-fashioned baseball. I share with my kids that 
you know, I had an iPad way before you did. They'd go, coach, come on, you're 63 years old. When did you have an iPad? I said, they've had one out in left center field of every park I've ever played in. It's called a scoreboard. That was my iPad. I needed every, I got everything I needed to know on the scoreboard. I knew how many leanings were left, how many runs we were down, what we needed to do to come back. Pay attention to the game. It'll help them eliminate distractions. Um, you know, so many times when we have expectations for others, maybe it's our coaches, maybe it's our players, I really think that it's it's unfair. And I learned this, another lesson I learned the hard way, because we judge other people by their actions and ourselves by our intentions, at least I did. And with the expectations, so I have expectations for Jimmy Frush. I have expectations. Jimmy goes out and plays and doesn't meet my expectations. What's my reaction? I'm disappointed in Jimmy. He didn't put up the numbers I thought he was supposed to put up. Was Jimmy even capable of putting up the numbers that I was wanting him to put up or to, to meet the expectations I had? I just don't think it's fair. I think it's I think it's a better way of building trust because truthfully, coaches, if a player doesn't trust you, you ain't ever going to coach you. You may think you're coaching him. You are not coaching him because he is not listening to you unless he trusts you. So be careful with the expectations. Um, more often than not, they've turned into resentments for me. I've learned that one. I've learned that one the hard way. Um, the hitting versus pitching thing that usually boils down to a conversation, you know, chicken and the egg, which came first, hitting versus pitching, which comes first. Like I said, I haven't been in the game a long time. 47 years there's people have been in it longer but what i've learned good pitching stops good hitting every day of the week at every level you play at and we've had some monster offensive clubs in colorado we had three years of pittsburgh baseball we were we were nails on offense and you run into that guy that's won a cy young award or something like that he shuts you down so whether it's juco ball or whether it's even little league when that those bulls go to the mound. You get that one or two starter. You get that tough guy. You need to find a way to play good offensive baseball and score a run, whether it's bunting, you know, whether it's moving a guy over, whether it's stealing a base, a lot of different ways, just some good old fashioned baseball skills that are going to help you win because those usually aren't the guys that you get 10, 12 hits off of and put up five runs. You got to find a way to scratch it out. Um, but good pitching always, always beats good hitting. And, I'm also a fan in, in the realistic part of the game. We got some people making tons of money up there. And I know sometimes you, you, you probably get involved in that. You think about how much money big leaders are making. But if you don't think the game's changed, we got a guy in our game today. I actually appreciate him as a pitcher. I'd love to have him on my staff. Um, the price tag would have to fit for me, but he's got two more Cy Young awards and he's got complete games in the big leagues. Man's won two Cy Youngs, and he's not thrown a complete game in the big leagues. It's hard for me to wrap my old man head around. However, that's where we are. So I better find a way to wrap my head around. Um, we, I'm part of this industry, because I'm sure you all watch Major League Baseball. You know, one thing I found out when I was a big league manager is everybody could do my job better than me. <laughs> all I had to do was get in a cab, uh, Drive and get a haircut because there's three people that are brilliant in any any city you go to. A bartender's a genius. Your barber is a genius. And the cab driver, they're geniuses. They got all the answers to everything. <clears throat> but the game, the game has changed in some areas. The people, I don't know if changed that much. I, you know, a lot of people say they do. But the hard part I have in all sport right now when I go out and watch games, and this happens at every level, I see it in Little League ball. I see it in Babe Ruth ball, Legion ball, Juco, Division Three, Division Two, minor leagues, big leagues. We don't allow our kids to fail. We try and leverage everything. And I think some of us think that if I can leverage every opportunity in the game, it gives us a better chance to win. Well, you may be right. You may be right. And you may be stepping on a lot of hearts along the way. Because if we go back and visit Mr. Snell, I'm sure many of you were watching that game when the Rays were playing the Dodgers in the World Series, the COVID year. Blake Snell was the only guy in the world that could beat the Dodgers that night. 
And as per the course of the season and the way the White Rays operate, that third time through the through, through the lineup, Blake wasn't going to get an opportunity to pitch. And I've actually had teams where the starter had us locked down. And for whatever reason, the other team thinks it's more important to make a change. And I don't, I can't manage two teams. I've never been good enough to manage two teams. I have enough challenges managing one. But that pitcher would leave the game that set us on lockdown. And if he had a low pitch count or something else, you just you couldn't figure out. I didn't try and figure it out. But all I know is all our hitters were sure glad he was gone. They didn't care why he was gone. He was walking off. And it, anybody else was going to be easier to hit than that guy. I just encourage you to remember what it felt like as a kid when you played, when you were given an opportunity to fail. And remember the sting of failure. But remember the opportunity for redemption you were given by that same coach later on, and you did not fail but you had success and what that made you feel like. And maybe it put another level of grit on you. Maybe put another level of toughness on you. Maybe it dipped you in some more want to or some how to. But I see games go on now where a pitching moves made, the hitter on deck doesn't even look for the coach. He just walks back to the dugout because he knew what he did. Let's not rip the heart out of him. You know, let's, let, let, let's try and remember they do have hearts. Um, I used to get in a little – conversation with one of my general managers frequently because he'd like to call our players pieces. And I understand the concept. They're sitting up high. They're looking over a game. They can move them around. They look like pieces. I said, when you come in the clubhouse, please never use the word piece. They're players. They got heartbeats and they know they do. I don't think, you know, some players probably don't bother by it. Some, some of my coaches may not have cared. I cared. I, I want them to be known as players. And I, and I wanted to remind people that they're players. They're not pieces. You know, the heart transplant, I'm a big fan of. Don't take it out of the kid. You know, if the kid's having fun, he's got a chance of hanging around, staying around. And there's no telling what kind of player he's going to be. But when we turn this thing into work, um, I know some of you say, well, it is work. It is work. But you got to find some fun. And I know through my travels in the past two years, I work all through our minor league system. I work from rookie ball in the Dominican to our rookie ball in Arizona, to our two A ball teams, double A and triple A. I encourage all our managers to find different ways to have fun with their team. You know, whether it be a theme, Dre, dress up, road trip. Uh, Jimmy Chester was on here with me a few years ago. I'm going to go to Gardner Webb this weekend, spend a weekend with Jimmy. Then I'm going out to Utah and I'm going to see Gary Henderson. We used to have water balloon contests on the left field line at some point in time during the season. We used to have just different games for them to play to let them get out of their baseball mind, their baseball headache, their baseball, whatever, and just let them decompress with a the game. Um, there's different things you can do. Putt, putt golf. I took some young kids to putt, putt golf, never played putt, putt golf. I guess miniature golf. Find some different things to break up your practice routines from time to time where it's just some fun. That's my encouragement. Again, these are all encouragements. I've done a lot of things that haven't worked. I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way. Um, I do believe that if we're not careful, we can have an eye problem. And I said this to one of my players one time. He said, well, coach, I don't have an eye problem. I just, so I just had a physical eye doctor said I was good. I said, no, we just had a conversation. And you used the word I 17 times in your first five minutes of talking. It was all about you. I said, brother, let's just sit back and understand if there's a different way you can look at it or just change the lens. I want you to be authentic and I want you to be you. But remember that one great player doesn't will never make a team. But one bad player, bad actor, bad character can ruin a team. Just keep that in your pocket as well. We need everybody. We need everybody involved. We need everybody at the end of the day, man, and I, I rarely feel strong about this one. I don't know how many coaches on here have ever heard of John Gordon. We just had John Gordon at our organizational summit in Colorado. We spoke to all 350 employees. I first ran into John Gordon back in 2010, just left the Rangers, headed for the Pirates. And I read a book by John Gordon, Dan Britton, who's the COO, global COO of FCA, 
and Jimmy Page, not the guy that shreds for Zeppelin. This was another Jimmy Page. It, it, it's a pastor. But the book was called The One Word Challenge. And what, what they were talking about is coming up with one word. It was based around New Year's resolutions, how hard that is, the failure. I've incorporated this with my coaching staff, with my team, with my players. We come up with one word. We just did it in Colorado. I just did it with our owner the other day, Dick Monford. His, uh, his word is octave. My word was mudita. Mudita. It's a Buddhist term. I'm not trying to impress anybody. The word found me. It's a Buddhist term for having unbelievable joy for somebody else's success. Again, 47 years in baseball. Guys, I've been on teams that had it. And it's a beautiful thing when your team has it. I've been on teams that didn't have it. And it's a hard, usually always a hard season follows when you don't have it. Whether it's the coaches, the manager, you're pulling for everybody. You're just not, you're not just the hot coach. In other words, the coach that just goes to the players that are hot and doing really well. I actually had a coach in Colorado. <laughs> one of my players strolled in my office one day. He said, we need to talk. So what do you got, brother? He goes, you guys pull so-and-so out of it. He's in the, He's in the locker room. He thinks we haven't picked up on it. He only spends time with the guys that are just crushing. <laughs> I said, is it so-and-so? He goes, yes. I go, yeah, I kind of picked up on it. He goes, he thinks we're idiots. Like, we don't know it. I mean, your best coaching move, for me, it's always going to be to go to the guy that's not crushing it. Put your arm around that kid. Find some joy or just share some joy with that kid. Mudita. I don't know if you watched any of our pirate clubs uh, back in the, the mid 2000s, it was 13, 14, 15. I can remember one night out of nowhere walking into our club, our, our dugout, 10 minutes before the game. I'm getting ready to walk out of the lineup car. I got Sean Rodriguez building on a, just banging a drum like it's on one of those big Gatorade buckets. We got Josh Harrison dancing, Andrew McCutcheon's using as bad as a guitar. I got four or five other guys. They're singing. They're dancing. They're going nuts. I'm looking down there. I'm going, holy cow, what the heck? Well, then I'm going to leave them alone. Now, this is not the time to say anything. So we played pretty well that night. I let it go. They come out the next night. They're doing another song. They're dancing. They're going nuts. We got 12 guys at the end of the dugout just having a jam. I didn't say anything. We win again third night same thing happens i get a call the next morning from my dad he's like what in the heck is going on in your dugout he said you gonna let that go on i said dad we've won five in a row they're crushing it i ain't getting away of this train man <laughs> i said there's no way i'm touching this because old clint that's not something i ever did probably something i never would have done just didn't play in that area didn't play in that time these kids are just expressing themselves they're getting ready for a game different than i would have doesn't make it wrong because they were going out and playing. And I guess my encouragement at the end of this, because we're going to take some questions and we're going to talk about uh, bat around a little bit, but my, my encouragement is, man, you are in such a sweet position to be coaching kids. Because Billy Graham said, you know, a coach will make more of a difference in the life of, of, of some young kids than a pastor ever will. The touches you get, the opportunities you get, and the coaching doesn't just happen on the field or the dugout sometimes. There's no telling where you can meet them. I used to lap the, the outfield during BP and talk to my relievers. I used to find times to grab a position player and talk to him somewhere else. The office is usually the last place. Nobody wants to go to the principal's office. Um, I'm so, the, I am still so encouraged by what our young kids are doing and some of our young coaches are doing. Some of these programs that are out there are outstanding. I'm not going to get in a fist fight about travel ball, showcase ball. I think there's good to find if you hunt it. I think there's bad to find if you hunt it. I love baseball. I love coaches that love to coach baseball, and I love to work with players that love to play baseball. So that's my little share tonight. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Andrew or to Matt for some questions or whether we talk about bat around or wherever you want to go next. Outstanding. Okay, well, I guess I need to give my 30-minute rebuttal to everything Clint said then, right? <laughs> no, for it. no, 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 I can't. I can't. I can't argue with with uh, much any of it, Clint. That was some really really good stuff. And sorry for the technical issues issues earlier. I'm Andrew Bartman, director of coaching development at USA Baseball. I've hosted uh, 79, I believe, of our virtual coaches clinics, um, and and including this one tonight. So super thankful for Clint 
and for uh, Matt and for Baton Rouge for their support of our regional clinics and their support of USA Baseball's development uh, program overall. Uh, Clint, I did have a couple. Man, I got one thought and then a couple questions for you. Coach to coach, I coached college baseball for 12 years. Um, now I go around and, and help coach coaches, right, from all for all ages and all got a, all walks of the game. So my thought is this, like you said, um, it's a great time to coach, right? you got all these tools at your disposal, and then you can still have some of that, that quote-unquote, old-school wisdom behind it, right? Like all the stuff that your gut and your eyes were telling you, now you can just measure and see if you were right. You know, um, it's there for you. And I say at every every community coaches clinic that we have is we are – baseball is a crockpot sport in a microwave society right now. And so I have never had any food that tastes better in a microwave than it did in a crockpot. Like it takes time. It takes a whole lot of time. We're trying to get that through to kids and even more so to parents who want instant results and instant feedback. I mean, they've just got to understand that, you know, it takes some time. It takes a little marinating to come out right. So uh, my, my first question to you is this. I love that you referenced that you worked with, you know, the Dominican League and the low A and the 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 high A and double A. And you've worked all through levels of minor league baseball, right? What you're doing. What do you see outside of the swing in terms of mental and or vision training that hitters are doing? What are they, what are they utilizing? Like, what do those routines look like? Are there some similarities that you see level to level that different guys are doing? Well, I think, yes, there are some similarities. I don't think we as an industry have done as good a job and we're capable of doing on the vision training side of it. Um, it starts with your eyes. One of the first questions I always have for hitters, Todd Helton just got in the Hall of Fame. Closest relationship I have with any player I ever had. But there were days when he would come back and have a swing and he'd want to know what I thought about a swing. And the first thing I'd ask was, did you get a good pitch to hit? Now, he's one of the few, Andrew, that could get a hit, do damage on a ball that wasn't in the strike zone, but not many can. So did you get a good pitch to hit? Did you see it well? Because we can build things in a cage or in a controlled environment that really look pretty with a ball on a tee or slow, a slow flip or some, some minimal velocity. But now we gas it up. And if we're not seeing it good, we're already done. We're already way behind. We're digging. We're trying to climb out of a hole. Vision training, I think we're enhancing it with our organization. We're trying to take some steps to even improve it this year. Talking to kids about actually what they're seeing. Talking to kids about where they look for. How do they track the ball? Do they use transferring of eyes? Where are they picking up? Because some kids will say, hey, I was told to use picking up off the shoulder the release point. I steer there the whole time. And if you, you, you do your little bit of a homework, you'll find out that the longer you stay locked in on one spot, the reduction of vision starts picking up. It's not as clear as it is when you initially flash on. So Todd Helton got into transferring a vision told by Tony Gwynn. He would look at the bottom, maybe the, the bill of the pitcher's hat, and then the last second, then he'd flip over the release point. That's your most acute vision. So I see that. I do see different strokes for different folks as far as some kids like the tee, some kids don't like the tee. We like to use a ladder drill for velocity. We like to use the spin machines. I still think it's important to hit off a live arm, to see a body moving in an arm. I think it's – but we, we break it up where we're challenging them. We're trying to make practice much harder. Baseball was the last sport to the dance on trying to replicate game speed for practice. Because back when I played every day, it was a 55-year-old man throwing 55-mile-an-hour fastballs in the middle of the plate, and you rake. That was our batting practice. There wasn't a lot of challenge to it. Ground balls, you know, the coaches didn't smoke them at us. Maybe maybe if he pissed them off or something, maybe he would. But this, the repetitions were slow. They were methodical and they were easy. I see a lot of people now working more for harder practice, you know, more more intense practices, which makes the game easier to play. Um, as far as swing pass, swing plane, I don't – I've not run into a hitter yet. One of the biggest things that I'll ask him, are you, are you on time? And what I mean by on time is your foot down. When you see the ball, there's no head jilt. You're seeing the ball, your foot's down, and you're getting your swing off. Because I can show them a video, you know, all their best. You're late. You're late getting your foot down. You're late landing. That puts you in a panic zone. The only one way to catch up is usually to spin out, to, you know, to spin out. So we talk about just being on time and being on plane are the first two things I talk about. What I mean on plane, angle of the pitch, bad angle to connect, to maximize consistency of contact. Those are just some of the, the, the few things I try and keep simple with these kids.
because they've probably, by the time they get to the big leagues, Andrew, they could have had anywhere from 15 to 20 hitting coaches along the way. And they have accumulated so much information. Some of it's very, very good. And some of it's not so good for them. I agree. I completely agree. And hell, uh, some of them have 15 hitting coaches in a year. Uh, some of these younger kids, you know, they just go from one to another. Uh, now, something that's become a, a pretty big topic of conversation in the baseball world, the guys that I've talked to is really differentiating between what is a hitting coach and what is a swing coach? Because there's a lot of hitting coaches or swing coaches out there, I guess, masquerading as a hitting coach. And there's a lot more to hitting as we reference than the swing. And I think a lot of the focus is being put on the swing. And that's why I like to ask smart people like you that, you know, you may have been around the block a couple of times and uh, just want to know what people are doing outside of the swing, because like we, we spend so much time on the swing and I've seen kids and you've seen kids too, doesn't matter what age they are. When I was a college coach and I'm recruiting and you see a kid at a workout, and you're like, man, that swing plays. Ooh, it's nice. And then you see him in a game and it's not so nice because it's he's not a hitter. He's a swinger. So I like to I love getting your feedback on that. We do have some questions that have come in from the audience. If you've got a minute, Clint, to sure. uh, to give some feedback on those. Great. Um, Rich is saying one of the hardest things that he and his wife are contending with in the first season of coaching are kids who fail to pay attention. And, oh, boy, if someone's got a magic uh, answer for this, you can make a lot of money. Uh, someone just digging the dirt, watch the ball go by, attention spans are lacking, shed some light on increasing attention spans, getting to keep their head in the game. And, Clint, before you answer, as someone who coached 8U uh, recreational softball this past summer, uh, there were some things, you know, uh, moving them around to different positions and just creating little games uh, within the game for them and trying to get them to – to find little wins, you know, little wins add up into a big win and they, they keep playing. So if, if we uh, focus never on the scoreboard, focus is on uh, learning something new that day, right? That might be learning how to, learning how to pre-pitch, learning how to present our glove, learning how to do, you find those little things and they can practice it throughout the game. That's something that I found uh, gave us some success this year. What do you, what do you think? Uh, some ideas for enhanced attention spans for younger kids. Well, no, it is a great question. And I can tell you from a parent's perspective, my son Christian started playing ball at four. I just been fired in Colorado. It was the second month of the season, going the third month. I watched my four year old go out and play with a bunch of four year olds. And about halfway through the season, the coach came over and asked me, Hey, you, Mr. Hurley, yes, would you like to coach? <laughs> it was like, I, you know what? Right now I'm good. I just got fired. I was working with a little bit of an older group over there. And what you're doing with these four year olds is fantastic. You know, my son is Christian. He's first thing he said was, your son's a really good player. And I said, okay, coach, turn around. My son is the guy that's got his glove on his head. My son is the guy that's riding his bat. My, that's my son. So my son's not a great player. He wanted to try it. We'll see where it goes. But I said, what I would encourage you to do is in, find a ready position, get young kids in. The ready position is critical. So in other words, I would get them on the mound, say, okay, here, I'm going to pitch ready. And they have to take one, two step, get in the fielding position. I teach them the proper way to get in the box, just a, an athletic professional way to get in the box. Uh, we kept things simple. What you said is perfect. Small bites, small wins, break down the skill set, break down the technique to make it easy. We'd run the chain relays. And that's the way, the, the way the kids would get loose rather than playing catch because it was hard for them to play catch. They played chase more than they played catch. Their legs were ready, but their arms weren't. So we just run the chain relays, just small bites, small successes. And for the kids that aren't paying attention, that's time, those are times where maybe you can have a sidebar conversation and say, hey, I saw that you really weren't into it today. Your focus really wasn't there. You know, what do you, you have anything you can share with me? I've had kids actually tell people, I don't like to play. I don't, this is what I have. End of story though, my right. son Christian re retired at the end of the season. He retired from baseball at the end of his four-year-old season, and he never looked back. That was his experience with baseball. Oh, man. It's uh, it's interesting, isn't it? The things that, that they're exposed to, the things that kids are exposed to, and the things that they'll just latch on to and never let, let it go, and then the things that they're just like, eh, I'm done, you know, and no one yeah. – you, you can never really pinpoint it. That's good info. Um, I do – I'm going to say one thing, though. You told them that it's uh, they were chasing the ball more than catching the ball. Something that worked with my AU team was 
I know a lot of you have puppies and dogs at home, but we're playing catch, not fetch. You play fetch with your dog in the backyard, okay? We want to play catch. We want the ball to go in the glove. So uh, try to pick and choose a few questions here. Please don't take offense if uh, if your question does not get asked uh, on air here. Um, something Sean Stallings, coach of seven and eight-year-olds, some of them do not have strong arms. That's all right. Um, how can he help increase our arm strength, coach? Give a Nothing simple like answer. Yes, play catch. Start them short and just move them out periodically. Maybe from having played catch for three three days. I don't know how much he practices. Number one, I don't know how many games they play, but I build up a succession program where they play catch at X distance for three days. Then they take two steps back, play a little bit farther, and people go, "Well, that's simple." That yeah, who did? I saw Vince Coleman go from a below average thrower at the major league level to an average throwing arm because Whitey Herzog put him in a throwing succession program, the kind of ones the trainers employ when a pitcher's coming back from injury. But you can do it with eight-year-olds. You can do it with seven-year-olds. You can do it with 10-year-olds that don't have arm strength. It's not about strength in a weight room. It's not about weightlifting strength. It's about arm mechanics, number one. Make sure you work with their mechanics where you know they're coordinated. It, it's, a, it's an athletic movement when they throw it. And then just the reps, and then just building up, building out the distance slowly. Absolutely. Love it. You got those younger kids, you can have one day a week at practice or even before a game. You can have a long toss contest. You can throw the ball the farthest, right? And just give them each four or five throws and try to really, really stretch it out. That's good stuff. Man, this this is a really, really, you saying really, really, this is an outstanding question here from Josh. As someone who did not grow up in baseball but will do whatever I can for my child to succeed, what do I need to focus on in learning to coach the sport? Man, that's a really good question. It is, Josh. Good question. And then, Josh, I would ask you for – I'm going to ask you a question. What is your definition of success for your child? You know, we do have some people I've actually talked to. I mean, this is a lottery system for them. You know, what they invest is what they're hoping to get out of it. Um, and the game, the landscape of the game has changed so much. I mean, some people are in it. To, I, my son's going to be a major league. He's going to be drafted by the major leagues. Well, now you don't need to get drafted by the major leagues. Or if you're not in the first two rounds, there's NIL money. I mean, this is way down the road. But I'm just saying the whole landscape changes. So I wouldn't even worry about the landscape. I'd find a way to at least explain to myself, does he like the game of baseball? Does he enjoy the game of baseball? What does he like about what's hard for him? You know, accentuate the strengths. You're definitely going to work with the weaknesses. But it's also to understand one of the things I, I do with every kid is explain to them the reason why you play a game. What's the reason why we play the game? Is it to win the game? Is it to become better players of the game? Is it to become a better team at the game? I think all three can come into play at certain times. But when you can get that child to come up with his own definition of success, oh, I love to play. I want to be a good pitcher. Well, then let's let's work on throwing strikes. Let's work on command. You don't have to strike everybody out. Well, I want to be a good hitter. Let's hit the ball hard where it's pitched. Let's not work on home runs. Let's not run to home runs. I want to be a, you know, a defensive player. Okay, let's make sure we know throwing mechanics, fielding mechanics, just so our body's working right and our arms working with our feet. Slow it down. Let them have some ownership of it. The biggest, I think, success is, to use that word I've had with players, is when I've incorporated them in the equation to have to, for the, to give them ownership of what we're doing, to include them. And I don't think it matters whether they're eight, 18 or 28. That's a great point. Great point. Question from Jay here. His 11-year-old son, his or her 11-year-old son steps out the plate, little afraid of being hit by pitch, knows when he does it, it makes weak contact. Any suggestions? This comes up at clinics of ours all the time, and I've got a great solution for you. Pitch to them in practice, have them stand behind a screen or behind a fence, throw balls to them, let them stride load, let them see how far the ball travels, let them get that spatial awareness of where the ball really is, and by taking out the fear of being hit by a pitch. So it's a great, simple, simple, if you've got a fence or a net, you can do that and um, and take some of the fear out of that. And also, Guero, uh, best resources that are oh, – sorry, Clint, go ahead. I had one thing that, to add, if you don't mind, just because I saw it last week yeah. at, a, at a Little League park. I got a coach, heart of gold, same kind of do anything for his team to help. He's throwing batting practice to his 8- to 10-year-olds. He's 6'6". Six, six. He's throwing at a downhill angle that is just so yep. acute. And so 
actually I'd watched it long enough and he'd asked me to come out and give him some feedback. And I said, Hey, can I borrow you for just a second? You go right back over there. He came over and halfway through the bank, I said, just get down on one knee, dude. You're so big. It's, it's just the, the, the opportunity for him to hit is really limited right there. So this guy got down on one knee, flattened the plane for these kids. And all of a sudden, all of them hit better. Almost every one of them hit better the second round than the first. Just something simple like that. So that's just a reminder sometimes if they're not having success hitting or they're not, find a way to slow that drill down or at least and don't enhance the angle, flatten the angle for them, try and help them out a little bit. Excellent point. Excellent point. Uh, Guero, Guero, sorry. Uh, best resources that are not the YouTube coaches. Love this question too. And I could name quite a few but I've got to stick with the tried and true USA baseball has a free online coaching certification platform, free courses you can take. And uh, best of all, the, uh, the USA baseball app, and there's got a drill library in there, beginner, intermediate, advanced. It's got a ton of content from USA baseball, from some of the best coaches, players, minds in the game. Please check that out. Um, it's, it's right there at your fingertips and it's really easy for us to promote it because it is free. No, no catch. Uh, download the app and get better right there. Thanks, Tyson. Saying the USA Baseball app is incredible. That's awesome. We appreciate it. All right, one or two more questions here uh, before Coach has to go. Uh, oh, this is good from Era. How do you balance giving advice to a struggling hitter and then not talking too much to pile on the mental grinding that they're experiencing? Yeah, how do you thread that needle, Coach? Well, obviously, at that point in time, you've got some data to work off with. You know, the eye test, you watch what's going on. Um, one of the things, you know, we have we have the ability to do is have video. In some of these cases, you're not going to have video. Um, what I do with the young players when there's no video, I try and find a guy on the team that's got a similar complication. And in batting practice and even the game, I'd either remove that young man, have him watch from behind the batting cage or what like a similar player is doing, maybe spinning out. Maybe it's a big head whack when his foot hits the ground. Maybe it's, you know, once he sets his front foot, the, the shoulder angle so so dramatic that it's just straight uphill. Whatever it might be, I try and say, hey, have you been watching Steve? Have you been watching Johnny? You know, they seem to be struggling with some of the things you're struggling. And then, well, yeah, so, so we watch that a little bit. Then oh, I haven't watched the good hitters. You see Tony up there. See that foot come down, land, see how – loose his grip is, um, whatever it might be. See, after he makes impact or contact, his head stays right there. He's not tracking the ball. It's, you know, the barrels, the eyes aren't following the barrel. So I try and give him a couple looks. Watch the kid that's struggling. Watch the kid that's doing well. And tell him, what do you see different? What are you noticing that's different? And how can we apply it to your swing? Outstanding. Outstanding. All right, let's get one more question in here. Matt, did you see? Any in here that you'd want me to grab? Or I have cart yeah. launch. You're on a roll. Okay, great. Uh, Josh, real quick, uh, this does not, not count towards your C-level certification. This is a special event, uh, but we will be listing our February virtual coaches clinics uh, very soon, uh, probably by the end of this week. All right? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> the hitting coaches question. If you're the current coach, how do you coach a kid on your team when they're saying their hitting coach wants them to do it their way? And I'll preface it with this, man, just me, personal opinion, not a, uh, not a USA baseball opinion. There are instructors and there are coaches in baseball and instructors specialize in something, right? And a coach I'm worried about leading men or women, growing them as people, winning games, utilizing all the players on my team to win a game and instructors trying to get you better at one particular task, hitting, pitching, strength and conditioning. There's a lot of ways around it. Um, so the, the beautiful thing is when you have a player's instructor and their coach, and even further when they get older, their high school coach and their summer coach and the instructor working together towards the common goal on the same page. But uh, that honestly is a world of rainbows and unicorns and butterflies because everybody everybody really wants to be right. So, Clint, uh, I'm sure you dealt with this uh, probably in the professional level. Guys have swing coaches, and they would go to them. And I don't know if you had rules about in season, out of season, whatever the case may be. But how did you navigate that that path with those professional, a little bit different professional athletes? But how do you navigate that? 
No, there's no doubt players have their own swing coaches. I mean, we just built our lab for the Rockies in Scottsdale mm-hmm. with hit tracks. We're actually going to put bat around in with it. We have every measuring analytical device you can have. And it's not because we're afraid of what the kids are doing, where they're going. The, the multiple places or options they have is just giving them an option. If you don't want to pay somebody, we got, we got the same tech here. You can come work with our coaches if you want to. Some kids are more comfortable working with other people. Some kids, I just tell them, be careful that you, you need somebody that's going to coach you up and have a, a hard conversation with you. You don't need a bobblehead as a coach. We actually went out of our way to ask our players, can we help build a bridge to your hitting guru or your hitting coach rather than a wall? Because you know they're awesome. going to go to them. You know they're going to listen to them. If, if you're not, you know, you're not, you're not, in the real world and we had a lot of success and basically we bring the hitting coach or the hitting group into bp let them see our environment let's see what we're doing we're not trying to hold anything back or close to the best they may not want to they may not want us to go to their venue but one of the first questions i was i would always ask them is hey if you guys are going to hit early at 10 o'clock can i come down to the games and watch what you do with it and you knew if, i thought you knew a lot about the coach when you learn what his answer is if he'd say yes I say, okay, we got a chance here. If he said no, that's when I'd be. I'm going to wait for an opportunity and ask, you know, ask Starling or ask Andrew, what's going on? You know, why, why is it inhibited? Why does it? We got to be behind closed doors there when we're completely transparent and open with everything we do. Do you not agree with what we're doing? Do you not believe David Eckstein or do you not believe Rick Eckstein? The guys I had working with hitters in Pittsburgh, my last two years there. Uh, communication is the biggest thing. Clarity of communication transparency builds trust. And I, I really believe in that. You got to have a conversation with them to see where it takes you. Excellent. 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 All right, coach Clint hurdle. We appreciate you being on tonight, sharing with everybody here tonight. I know we're going to touch on bat around here uh, real quick. They are the presenting sponsor of this event, and then we'll add a few pieces in there towards the end. So coach, any parting, any parting words before we queue up this video? Not for me, I would just ask everybody to be open-minded. You know, Matt and I have been working on this project a long time. We developed it starting in 2020 when the thoughts were put into play. We've gamified BP. We, we're, we're trying to help find a way to make BP fun again, to find the swing in somebody, to help them learn how to have a feel to hit, to control the barrel, to use the barrel. I mean, and it's six simple rounds, we call them, and I'm going to let Matt play the video. It was put together. I'm going to throw some names at you, and this isn't to stargaze, but these are the these are the guys I went to that we signed up that worked with us: Sean Casey, Jeff Cirillo, Coles, David Eckstein, Louis Gonzalez, Hafner, Matt Holiday, Todd Helton, Fred McGriff, Juan Pierre, Ryan Spielberg, Kevin Young. Good hitters. Six rounds. Lenius around the world. Lunchbox. Gamer. Laser show. Walk off. Each one of these rounds has a hitting technique in it that you've got to perform to score points. I'll leave it at that. It's awesome. I've seen it. I've seen it in motion a couple of times. It is really, really awesome. Really, really cool to see. Um, like we've got the video queued up here. It really tells the story, paints the picture. And uh, before we do that, I will say a few folks asked about the recording for this. It is recorded. It will live on our USA Baseball YouTube channel under our Coaches Clinics playlist. So you can have all 78 or however many Coaches Clinics are on there. And in addition to this webinar as well. So, all right. Play the video. Well, and, and Clint, I'm going to just turn the volume down on it. If there's anything you want to talk over it or, or call out, uh, uh, feel free. Thank you. I kind of like the volume. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> turn on the volume. Okay. Most of this video is from the College World Series in 2023. This past weekend, we did a demo at the Rockies Fest uh, as, as part of their fan uh, fan experience at Coors Field. And we'll be going to the Tampa Bay Rays Fest here in a couple of weeks uh, down on the on the turf at the Trop. Matt, can I call something out? Volume. People are paying attention. I hope people are paying attention to this, how there's kids in there, and then there's also 
people of a certain age in there as well, right? This isn't just for this isn't just for in season baseball players. Anybody can jump in and and essentially play a video game in the cage. We've had a we we have a couple different paths, Andrew, and one is the batting cage. Uh, route and for player training and sometimes it's to break mm-hmm. up practice sometimes it's just to create a little intensity for a, a player and then we've also taken an, an entertainment route uh, such as what we did with the Rockies Fan Fest we had special needs kids play we had little kids and grandparents play and so we feel like it's something you can enjoy and put a bat in anybody's hands to to really experience it. And we just see people using it different ways. It's a very successful tool for coaches. I mean, when you get rain to break up your BP monotony, to take it in the cage, hit the cage. How about the snow during the winter? We pair it with hit tracks. They're one of our partners. Obviously we're partnered with USA baseball as well. We're in five big facilities right now. We're in Westchester PA. We're in no West Winchester, New York. We're where is it in Pennsylvania, Matt? Philly area. The Philly area. Then we're at the farm in Colorado Springs. We're at the Hit Lab in Palmetto. We're in Atlanta with Rick Eckstein. Uh, we're up and running. Um, we're accumulating data. We're trying to get this in the hands of any facility or maybe coaching program, college program that has a Hit Tracks program. We'll send you the link. We'll hook you up. We need feedback this year. We want people to use it. Uh, we've got professionals using it. We've got college kids using it. It's not just for little kids. The course of the game, though, there's 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 drills to perform. There's execution involved. We have a BAM number that you get assigned. It's a it's a metric. It's the bat around metric. All the analytics come into play at some point in time, and sometimes it's not about analytics at all. It's about performing the task. Walk off is a game you've been playing since everybody was six. Bases loaded, two outs. Here's your hit, your swing. You either win or you don't. You either got a hit or you didn't. Lenius is for line drives hit towards the center of the field. Lunchbox is performing an offensive drill. Um, kids can play this game without instruction. The first couple times that I was involved, sometimes we would have coaches come in and say, well, let me tell me how to play so I can help them. I said, no, you sit, here, sit back here with me. And the optics come up on the screen and tell the kids just what they got to do. It shades the area where they need to hit the ball. They can figure it out on their own. But there's competition involved as well as performing a task or a fundamental. And you combine those two, and I think that's where the magic happens. It's not just the same old, same old BP. It's a heightened awareness. You know, there's going to be a player card. Matt, you can, you know, expound on that for maybe just a quick second. But we've got this thing lined up where we're off and running now. We were at the College World Series. We're going to beat the Tampa Bays uh, on their concourse, the Rays, to sign a contract with them. We're trying to get some major league ballparks also so fans can see it. But we've got college coaches uh, right now that'll be employing this our, our bat around in their cages and their facilities this coming college baseball season right now. Yeah, I'll just I would just quickly add that the bat around metric, I always refer to it as the decathlon of hitting. It's te- testing just different skills of cross hitting, whether it's moving runners, moving the ball around the field, or just hitting under the clutch and it all rolls up into one number, that bat around metric. And then the bat around app, all that data comes back uh, to the app, you leaderboards, there are challenges that you can do. I can challenge Clint and Bart and Jimmy to it, uh, a, a certain achievement of hit a ball over X miles an hour, or I can open it up to the community. And then there's just some fun stuff where you can create your own uh, digital baseball card. Um and that imports whatever your latest BAM score is. So it's updated in, in real time. Uh, just again, to go back to that word fun of just gamifying BP, having some metrics. And quite honestly, going back to the subject of this entire Zoom of how do you Clint's vision of applying old school principles to new school technology and how to present it is really just the core of what bat around is trying to achieve. Matt, I just want to make sure everybody understands that right now you're giving it away. That's true. That's correct. You have to have a hit track system. 
Uh, it is built on hit tracks and, but it is a free software download. We just have a, a simple, straightforward license agreement that says it's a free product and we send you a link and you put it on your uh, hit tracks PC, just like you're adding Microsoft Word. Um, it's a click and install, create an account in the app and you can start playing. Outstanding. And again, this is this is kind of like a call to action where um, I typically ask folks at any clinic, virtual or person, hey, it's awesome you're on here tonight and it's great that you're here getting better, but we need you to share this info about all of USA Baseball's free resources. Same goes for you on here tonight, man. If you, well, I don't have hit tracks in my facility. Yeah, but you know someone who does or you take your kids somewhere to hit uh, indoors that maybe has it. So please, you know, share the word and share this great program with anyone that you know or any facilities that you know that potentially have um, have the hit tracks in there, whether it be a private facility or a college or a high school. I mean, anywhere that's got it, uh, we can plug and play and be ready to roll. Well, Bart, Jimmy, we, we just appreciate you. We appreciate this partnership and whether it's improving a player or making them enjoy the game or putting a bat in somebody somebody's hands for the first time or in a long time. We love being a, a part of this and play our small part in growing the game. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you for your continued, thank you for your continued support, Matt, of, of what we do and especially the regional clinics and uh, coach hurdle. Thanks for sharing your wisdom tonight, my friend. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. I did send you a slide with my information on for any coaches that are out there that like to stay connected with me. I don't know if you can pull that up. I, I you know what? You are right. Let thing. me grab that. It's on Instagram. I'm on Instagram. I'm on X. I also have, there's going to be a QR code that's going to come up that you can pull. I send out two free emails every day. One's a devotional, but the other's leadership and encouragement. I'm trying to help coach coaches. I'm just sharing experience, strength, and hope in a lot of different ways whether it be the platform on X, whether it be a platform on Instagram. Um, I'm just trying to be a lifelong learner, a white belt mentality. I'd love for the coaches to, to reach out. There may be something that I can, I can be of service to you with or provide another resource for you if I don't have an answer. But those are three ways to stay connected to me uh, on X, on Instagram. And that QR code will pull up clinthurdle.com, which is actually where I send the emails out of. I mean, I got a wooden Wednesday. I got James Clear on Thursday. I got John Gordon on Tuesday. Different people that I read and share from uh, experience experiences. Um, I write some of them my, my own. Um, there it is right there. Um, for anybody, feel free. None of them have any subscription prices with them. <laughs> hey, I had a former, I had a former player tell me if it's free it's for me i'll take anything that's free you're definitely going to get your money so so we're going to you're going to get your money's worth right clint absolutely good that's good that's good we've got we'll leave that up for another 30 seconds for a minute and uh, i just want to once again thank matt bat around thank clint and jimmy for setting all this up uh it's been great i learned something a couple of things tonight that that i hadn't learned and it's like anything else man there's some things coach said that validated what I already thought. There's some things he said that challenged the way I thought, and it's a really good growth mentality and just being able to come and chop it up and talk baseball tonight. So thank you all for being here.